Okay, good morning. Hi, everybody. On June 28, 1914, in the city of Sarajevo, a Bosnian Serb by the name of Gavrilo Princip, age 19, stepped out of the crowd and assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austrian throne. This one event would precipitate a series of decisions by European leaders that will bring the great powers into the First World War. And it will be the failures of European leaders to negotiate a thoughtful peace settlement that will ultimately lead to the Second World War. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie. And I'm Todd. And we're excited to learn with you today. So welcome to AP Live. Glad you guys are with us. We're going to try and get two world wars done and unpack uh, the structure for DBQ. So, you know, a lot of heavy lifting, but I think we're ready to go and I hope you are too. So just to give you an update, update or an idea of what the purpose is, the purpose of these sessions is to supplement your learning from throughout the year in your AP European history course. We get a lot of feedback from you, which we appreciate very much. Some of you are asking, you know, what should we do for content? And you know, there's only so much time in this session for us to give you that. So we give you the essential content and the rest is going to be up to you. Um, but we also want to provide assignments for you to practice for the upcoming AP European History exam. And we're going to have one of those, a big one for you today. All right. And we also want you to submit your assignments. You know, the best way to practice skills is to practice them. So submit them and then let us show you with important feedback um, how you can better understand what you can improve on your own writing. And if we don't choose yours as a sample, you can absolutely look at, our, at what we've selected and see how that compares to what you wrote during your homework. Um, we also really want these review sessions to make you feel like you're not alone. We want you to feel a sense of community with students like yourself from other schools around the country and from international schools around the world. Um, we've all had a challenging year. We're getting towards the end of it. And um, we hope that together we can really help you to do well on this year's exam. Okay, here we are Wednesday. Um, and yeah, we are gonna do World War I, World War II as our content review for you today. The skill development, we're gonna unpack and structure the DBQ response. Lots of questions still with that. Um, like how do we make sure that I have enough time? And so part of that is having a plan and a structure. And so we're gonna go through that. In your homework, we're gonna give you a full DBQ. And I know that's a lot to turn around, but we really, as Katie just said, the best way to get better at this, the best way to, how do I get this done in time is to sit down and practice and sit down with that structure and really start working on that because that will help you more than anything. Tomorrow, we will finish up with the Cold War in Contemporary Europe. And we, a lot of you have been asking for uh, the differences between the formats and a lot of reminders. And so we will do that as well tomorrow. Absolutely. And um, I know it is, I know my own students who are practicing a DBQ um, frequently, it is a lot to do a DBQ as an extra homework assignment, but many of you are a little bit, you know, just a little bit over a week until that exam. And this is really an important piece of the exam. So we encourage you to take advantage and practice and time yourself and see how, what you can really come up with. So yesterday we gave you a couple of different options to practice short answer questions. There was one that's a map and um, that's definitely gonna be on the digital portion of the exam. And then Todd's gonna go over the secondary source, which everyone on all formats of the exam is gonna have to do. So um, the map, which and I, I've actually should have included a picture so we could have had a look at it again, but the A task was to describe a political purpose of the map. And so if you see there color coded, we have a response from uh, Romani at Carmel High School and they are the Greyhounds. And so this was a nice uh, kind of using the structure we've been giving you for the last week to uh, format the answer. So we have this, a political purpose of the map might have been to represent the partition of Africa following the Berlin Conference of 1884-85. And there's a topic sentence, use that work, the stem that's in the prompt there. Um, and then went on with evidence, the Berlin Conference was a consequence of new imperialism where European nations wanted to secure strategic colonies in Africa while simultaneously growing their respective nations power and might. And then it moves on to analysis, which I really liked. The map is illustrative of the way Africa was divided up between the European powers. And through the map, one can decipher the political advantages each nation might have had based on which African nation they possessed. So definitely thinking about the political context, why this map might have been created based on the time uh, that the map was in 1890s, I believe is what it had. So that's a really nice description 
of the political purpose. I think that we did a really good job there. So thank you. Yeah, really nice job, Romani. All right, the B task was explain, right? And we're definitely going a little deeper with that explain, um, how the situation in the map demonstrates a change from the political situation in Africa in the 1500s. So again, remember the map was 1890. So we start off with that topic sentence again that we really like, the situation in the map demonstrates a change from the political situation in Africa in the 1500s because of the amount of interaction between Europe and Africa. And then this is from Gigi, and Gigi did not give me her school, but Gigi went on to really give evidence and, and go deeper. In the 1500s, after the Treaty of Tordesillas, European powers like Portugal were only establishing trading posts along the coast with explorers like Diaz and de Gama, with support of rulers like Prince Henry of, uh, of Portugal, having explored there at the turn of the 16th century. And then we continue on. By the time of the map, the scramble for Africa had occurred, and countries all over Europe sought colonies all over Africa to increase national power and prestige and gain economic resources. An example of this is the way the small country of Belgium, whose ruler is supposed to be Leopold, Leopold II, that's all right, Leo, found a way to increase Belgium's power and prestige by colonizing the Congo. So there's a lot of evidence and there's analysis in this response. There's a lot going on here to show that change over time between the time of the map and the earlier period. So very nice response, Gigi. I wish I had your school so I could give it a shout out. And this last explain task, the C task said, explain how the conquest reference in the map affected European powers in the years after 1885. So this is from Margaret in Goochland High School in Virginia. They're the Bulldogs. So very nice response, Margaret, let's go through it. Uh, the conquest reference in the map affected European powers in the years after 1885 by causing increasing tensions between the European powers. There was an intense focus on obtaining colonies in Africa after 1885 to fuel the growing European economy because of the Industrial Revolution. We got some evidence there. This led to an intense land grab by European countries wanting to gain power and influence. This land grab led to increasing tensions between the major powers and played a part in causing World War I. Each country wanted more and more influence, notably a unified Germany and mainly Otto von Bismarck wanted to be recognized as world power, causing strife about colonies and partially leading to World War I. Overall, the conquest and the map affected European powers by increasing tensions and eventually causing World War I. So very, very nice job of moving that forward past the year 1885 and making some strong evidence and linking it together. I really liked that. That was a great job. Yeah, really nice response, Margaret. Um, and again, we're trying to show you this T structure. So some of those questions about how do I make sure that I'm getting everything I need to get in and how do I speed up my writing in that amount of time? If you have a structure and you can follow that, that then you're they're gonna be less likely to feel paralyzed as you're in that testing situation. Okay, the other homework we gave you was a secondary source. And so the A task in that secondary source, describe one piece, specific piece of evidence that supports the author's assertion about national identities. And as Katie mentioned, you can go to yesterday's um, uh, AP Live video and you can still download that. And I understand there was a little bit of a problem getting the secondary source. A lot of you wrote, I, I only had access to the map, but some of you found your way there. And so we have fewer, but we will get the A, B and C tasks. Okay, so again, here we go. We have our T, it's a described prompt. So. A lot of you were asking too, what's the difference between describe and explain? And we'll show you this T structure again to let you know, but many of you are going beyond describe, okay? Which is awesome. So there's our T structure, the topic sentence, the evidence and the analysis. And so in the blue, the author expresses their belief that nationalism leads to personal identity and national identity within people and groups. Yes, that is what the author does say. And we have a nice topic sentence to start us off. One example of this can be seen in the French Revolution, where the French people began to see themselves as French, even now being referred to as French citizens in the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And so that is a nice piece of evidence that you've put in there. And so what I'm trying to say is if this were, since this is just a described prompt, one piece of evidence, describe a piece of evidence, this on its own is enough to get the point because you've got to describe prompt. It's two sentences, that topic sentence introducing the argument and a very good piece of evidence as an example. And so that would get it done. But Veronica from Smithfield High School 
you have done better than that. And I think that's a great practice to get into. And she goes on, the common feeling among many French people of inequality and a need to change the governmental system led to nationalism because of a common goal and common culture that Frenchmen shared. This would lead to people's armies as France fought other countries in order to achieve its revolutionary goals. Ultimately, nationalism produces for national identities as can be seen in the case of the French who developed a, French, a sense of French identity from their common culture and goals. So well done, Veronica. And you've got that T-structure down and you've definitely earned the point there. This is from Jane. And Jane, I'm going to say awesome job that you've already color coded everything for me. I didn't have to do anything. So great job. We've got a describe prompt again. And Jane was like, please give me some feedback, even if it's bad. Jane, it's good. So don't worry. Um, one piece of evidence that undermines the assertion about the development of modern nationalist movements was the Spanish Inquisition. Okay, so we're talking about a piece of evidence that undermines the assertion that these nationalist movements didn't develop before did not develop before the 18th century. That was made by the author. And here is Jane going to give a contradictory piece of evidence. And she is uh, going to talk about Spanish Inquisi Inquisition. So we have that topic sentence. For instance, Spain was largely Catholic and together, the native Spanish people united through their shared interests and attempted to, I, I like your, you put converts question mark. And I think that's a better word here to use here, convert the Moors or, or expel, convert or expel the Moors and Jews from Spain. So that is a piece of evidence that is true and that would probably earn you the point with the described prompt. So nice job, Jane, but then you go on. This establishes that even before the late 18th century, when the French and American revolutions occurred, modern nationalist movements were developed. And so the argument Jane is making is that because of this faith-based uh, piece of evidence, that that is a, a sense of togetherness or nation, if you will. And so I think that would work, Jane. So nice job. All right. And here's our C task. Explain how one feature of nationalism led to the unification of a European power in the 19th century. All right. And so this is from Jade at Pine Bush Senior High School in New York. And again, now we have an explain prompt. So this is a higher task that you have to do. You not only have to tell us what it is, but you need to say how or why or because. All right, so we start with our T structure and our topic sentence. And nationalist ideals of pride led to the long feared unification of Germany. So we've named that European power. We have that in our topic sentence. Throughout the 19th century, nations surrounding Germany began to seek individuality and wanted their cultures to flourish and grow with a collaborative community. Again, talking about unification and nationalism. This created an air of allure and pull towards having the pride of a unified community. So I think that is evidence. And then it goes on, Germany decided that their attempts at unification, such as the Zollverein, which is that European cust or that German customs union, would not be thwarted again. They decided that it was time for the numerous German principalities to unite and that they would not be left out of this pride-fueled movement. So I think that is going to earn the point for you as well there. So good job with that, with that secondary source. Thanks. All right, so we have our content pieces today and Todd and I are both, we wanna let you know, we're just going over tiny pieces. I know that many of your teachers probably spent a lot of time on the world wars. We can't do them in five minutes, but we just wanna give you a quick refresher, particularly some of the things that are specific to what you're seeing on this slide in our course and exam description and some of the must knows that we talk about being in those blue boxes, we wanna just cover a few of those. So if you wanna move on to the next slide, we'll just kind of talk about, this is something that I do in my class. There are many different versions of this, um, acronyms in order to sort of remember causation for World War I and I use mania with my students. And so mania stands for, the M is for militarism, the A is for alliances, the I is, or sorry, the N is for nationalism. The I is for imperialism, which we're going to get into a little bit today with your homework. And then that last A is sort of the, the, the moment that this begins, the assassination of the Archduke, the heir to the Austrian throne. So I, I know my students really like these for, sort of to remember things and keep them straight. And causation is certainly an important part when we're doing any kind of conflict. So we're just going to quickly touch in a little bit more depth about these different pieces. 
And um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about military technology from World War I. But of course, we're not really getting into the, the entirety of the conflict. And I hope that your teacher had an opportunity this year to go into a lot of depth with you. So militarism, we have this idea of technology. The Industrial Revolution um, has happened. It had the second Industrial Revolution. We've had this uh, a, definitely a huge effect on the means of war making in terms of weapons. And we're going to talk about those a little bit at the end here. Uh, we have military values. There's strongly patriotic national presses and notions that war is manly and heroic, right? These are very well cultivated values. Countries will begin to have standing armies and these standing armies are trained and they're ready to fight. So this is an ideology that we're going to definitely see uh, is going to cause World War I. We also have policy making. We have secular leaders that rely on generals and military experts to help shape public policy. So militarism, the M in our little mania acronym. Okay, there's a whole lot of stuff going on on this slide that we're going to go through pretty quickly. There's a variety of alliances, friendships that are in place that bring other countries into this conflict and take this conflict from being a localized issue into a global issue. So these alliances that are developed between 1870 and 1914 created two sides bound by commitments to protect sovereignty or to intervene militarily, depending on what we had. We had the Three Emperors League, which was an agreement between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia, and Russia backs out of that in 1878. We have the uh, Dual Alliance and the Triple Alliance. The Dual Alliance is a promise between Germany and Austria-Hungary to aid, it, aid each other if Russia um, if they're going to war, or if Russia assists a nation that which either country was already at war with. We have the Triple Alliance, which is between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, of course, super important. Um, we have the Entente Cordiale, which is an agreement between Britain and France that resolves uh, colonial disputes and promises diplomatic support. We have the Triple Entente, which was an alliance between France, Russia, and Great Britain. So we, and then Russia is going to support Serbia if attacked by Austria, Hungary. So all of these entangled friendships are going to be important as we move towards war. And it's going to drag in all of these other countries. All right, imperialism, we're definitely focusing on that today. You know, we did our piece on imperialism yesterday uh, where your homework is gonna deal with imperialism. And so you see this map there, but imperialism is going to lead to conflict. And some of the you that brought that up in the homework that was due today did a really nice job. So conflicts over imperial issues are not an immediate cause of World War I, but it creates this tension and it provokes some countries to seek out and strengthen their alliances. And countries, as that answer in, in the short answer said, they want new markets and they want the prestige of these global empires. So definitely we're gonna see the I in imperialism is gonna be part of this. We also have the Moroccan crises in 1905 and 1911. And in 1905, Germany fears this alliance between Britain and France. It supports Morocco in order to provoke France and drive a wedge between these two countries. We're definitely foreshadowing what's going to happen in 1914 with that alliance between Britain and France. So we have imperialism as one of these tensions that's going to cause World War I. Our next letter. Uh, it's, I've clicked it. It's <laughs> lagging. No problem. There we go. I don't it. All right, nationalism. <laughs> it's like the beauty of being live. Um, so my students always say this is my favorite word in AP Euro because there's, there's nationalism is just ever present in the second half of the course. We have this sense of national identity, unifying characteristic things like customs and language and religion and traditions. And these are things that don't necessarily fit in borders of a map that they are, I call them sometimes in my class, sort of the glue that keeps people together. We have a sense of national belonging, um, voting rights, social welfare, the military draft, all of these things that contribute to that. Oh, and um, we have ideologies. And those ideologies, that glue that kind of help, helps keep people together is also exclusive often of other people. So we exclude others. We have race and social Darwinism. These all ideologies are gonna become really more prominent. And we have this kind of us versus them mentality that believes um, that we are nationally superior and that the other groups that lead to the denigra denigration of other groups. So this sort of nationalistic glue keeping people together, but also keeping other people out. I am not gonna read through this timeline for you. 
But I do want you to see how quickly we go from the assassination of the Archduke to full blown war with all of these other pieces being pulled in. So if you wanna have a look at this, you can pause the video, look through this timeline, but I don't need to read it to you because we wanna to get to that outline of the BBQ and we have other pieces to do here. So very quickly, we're gonna go through some of the new military technology. My students usually really like this that comes out of World War I. So um, you can see on the right here, we have a picture of the Battle of Verdun and we have the barbed wire that they're, they're crawling through. Um, we have planes that are used in World War I, um, first initially more for observation and reconnaissance, and then later on they are armed with guns. Tanks are used by both sides because they can crush through that barbed wire that you're seeing in the picture and they could cross over the trenches. We have the implementation of poisonous gases like chlorine and mustard gas. And even though this resulted in a very small number of deaths, it was a psychologically devastating part of the war. Machine guns are widely used by both sides during World War I because they're portable and they're powerful. And um, we've got flamethrowers. I have some great pictures that I show my students of flamethrowers and they, they just can't believe that these are real and they're first used um, near Verdun. And the U-boats, the submarines, and sort of that iconic German weapon, and it sinks um, ships throughout the war. And our last piece before we move on to World War II, as we're talking sort of about the uh, conditions that are happening, is trench warfare. And there's a picture there on the right of um, German machine guns in a trench. And we see this mostly, we see this along the Western Front, these long, narrow trenches that are dug into the ground. They're designed to protect troops. Um, from machine gun fire and also from the, uh, mil the artillery attacks from the air. These were trenches that faced each other, these opposing uh, trenches. And in the middle was this no man's land. It was an area that was dangerously unprotected, filled with mines and barbed, wi barbed wire. So this air middle center is no man's land. And um, the trenches were very horrific. They were, the conditions were inhumane. The trenches were exposed to the elements. Um, people died from the exposure. They died from um, being infested with rats and lice. And their cost of lives was staggering. And they often resulted in that word you're seeing bolded at the end, a stalemate. So the trench warfare really prolonged this conflict. No side is able to make an advance. All right, World War II. Todd, you're up. <laughs> Hey, good job. Sorry for the, the laggy internet, but we're going to talk about World War II, explain how technology and innovation affected the course. Um, yes, that's a learning objective, but it's really going to be a broad spectrum overview of what happened in World War II. Um, and we'll begin with this image on the right. And the war begins with the German invasion of Poland in a, a September. Well, it, it is in September of 1939. And so you see this makeshift bridge that the Germans have built as they're crossing the river, river into Poland. This is the uh, how the war begins. You can see this other bridge has already been destroyed, it looks like, and then they've made a makeshift bridge. So it isn't clear to me because of the image if the bridge was destroyed by the Polish or if it was destroyed by the Germans, but they've had a makeshift bridge. They've had to, a float bridge, they call it. So new military te technology would be important in World War II as it was in World War I and will make industrialized warfare and unfortunately genocide possible. New weapons such as planks, tanks, and trucks, um, better weapons, I guess, allowed Germany's Blitzkrieg, which means lightning war, to bring the Axis powers early victories. An example, this is the Polish campaign of 1939. Hitler's armies conquered Poland in only four weeks. And by spring of 1940, Germany had occupied Denmark, Norway, and Holland. And soon after that, France falls as well. Um, Hitler began to bomb British airfields and factories and in September of 1940, so we've just been one year, he began the indiscriminate bombing of civilian targets as well. By June of 41, Hitler broke the pact with Stalin. There had been a Russian and German agreement, a non-aggression pact, and they then go into the Soviet Union. Germany conquers Ukraine and was poised to take Leningrad and Moscow when a severe winter forced a German retreat. Here you see an image of, oh my gosh, we're going the wrong way. An image of the Germans entering Paris. And you can see the Arc de Triomphe in the background there as they're coming into the city. Pretty much un, un, no one's meeting them. It's un, un, uh, I can't remember the word. They're not uh, faced with any, any hostility. Hitler's new order 
was based firmly on the Nazi guiding principle of racial imperialism. Occupied peoples were subject to harsh policies dedicated to ethnic cleansing and the plunder of resources for the Nazi war effort. Germany then is gonna divide France into two parts. The German occupied the North, the Southeast remained nominally independent under the aging Marshal Pétain, who formed the Vichy regime, the French Vichy regime, which adopted many of the aspects of Nazis, national socialist ideology. And then these administrators, while they're in France, will steal, steal goods and money from local Jews. They will set the currency exchanges at very favorable rates for Germans, while well, soldiers were encouraged to steal and to purchase goods at cheap exchange rates and send them home. So a, food of, a flood of plunder reached Germany and helped to maintain high living standards, preserve morale at home, but that's certainly not what was going on in the occupied areas. Um, we're gonna also touch on the Holocaust. The, the learning objective is how and why cultural and national identities are affected by war because of the rise of these powers with one of those effects being the Holocaust. And so you see this image, it's the arrival of Hungarian Jews at Auschwitz and German occupied Poland in June of 1944. They are identified, you see, with that Jewish star of David on pinned to their coats. And this image is almost, I think, all women and children. You don't see any men in this particular image. Uh, the ultimate abomination of Nazi racism progressed from the condemnation of all European Jews is where they began and of other peoples considered racially inferior, this would include disabled peoples, people with Down syndrome, to extreme racial persecution, and then to annihilation in the Holocaust. 1941, Hitler and Nazi leadership ordered the SS, this is the, the secret police, to implement the final solution of the Jewish question, which meant the mass murder of all Jews in Europe. The Germans established an extensive network of concentration camps, industrial complexes, and railroad transport lines to imprison and murder Jews and other so-called undesirables and to exploit their labor from them before they died. And the surviving residents of the ghettos were loaded into trains and taken to camps such as Auschwitz, where over 1 million people, most of them Jews, were murdered in gas chambers. Jews in Germany and occupied Western and Central Europe will follow into that same fate, unfortunately. We'll continue with the war. With almost unchallenged air superiority, the U.S. and Britain will mount massive bombing raids on German cities to maim industrial production and break civilian morale. Civilian morale. The campaign of 1942, the German campaign against the Soviet Union, turned disastrous at the Battle of Stalingrad, and the Soviets will surround and systematically take out the German Sixth Army after it had looked like the Germans had it won. Um, come on, laggy. Here we go. Stalingrad presents the bloodiest battle in the history of warfare. 1.8 up to 2 million killed, it's still un uncertain, wounded or captured. Hitler, who had refused to allow a retreat, they suffer a catastrophic defeat for the first time. And so this is 1942, and they'd been at it since 39. German public opinion then turns decisively against the war. And then June 6th, D-Day as it's known, 1944, British and American forces landed on the beaches at Normandy, France, breaking through the German lines. By the spring of 1945, the Allies had reached Germany, forced the Germans out of Italy, so liberating Italy, and they had captured Mussolini. Um, and so one of the things that we do with my students when we have a trip to go to any of these places, we wanna make sure we visit these different grave sites. Um, uh, just to finish out the slide, the Soviets advanced into Poland, then into Marani Romania, Yugoslavia, and Hungary. They also entered Berlin, April, 1945. And so in your head, you can see the Soviets coming from right to left on the map, taking over into Germany with the allies, you know, Britain and the United States coming through France from left to right. Hitler then is in Berlin and commits suicide on April 30th, 1945. And then on May 7th, the German commanders will surrender. And that is VE Day victory in Europe Day, ending the war in Europe. Okay, we want to. Do you want to go through the rubric, Katie? Sure, sure. I'll go through the rubric really quickly, and then um, we can kind of talk through the structure. So you're seeing, if you remember, we've gone through this before, uh, which we did on Friday of or Thursday of last week. And so we have part A and part B. And part A is that you have a a thesis statement. 
that you respond to the prompt with a historically defensible thesis or claim that establishes a line of reasoning. Right, so that's one point we want to make sure. Maybe be careful with the line of reasoning. You definitely want to include that, and Todd will talk about that. You're going to start, then go. You're going to hopefully start with B, and then end that first paragraph with A. He'll show you that. But B is for contextualization, and so you're going to situate, then describe a broader historical context relevant to the prompt. Our C piece talks about the three potential points for evidence. So I'm going to skip over that first point. We want to do two points for supporting an argument in response to the prompt using at least six documents and be very intentional about that. And then that third point, the evidence beyond the documents, you're gonna use at least one specific piece of historical evidence beyond that that is found in the documents that's relevant to your argument about the prompt. So you're gonna bring in that outside piece. And then we've done a couple of different videos that have talked about sourcing. We want you to, in analysis reasoning for at least three of the documents, tell us why the documents point of view, purpose, historical situation, and or audience is relevant to a, an argument. And then Todd's gonna talk about this today with structure. Um, that, that last point is our complexity point. And there's a lot of different ways that you can get complexity on the document-based question. All right. Okay. So we're gonna have better luck yesterday, with the document camera today. <laughs> yesterday we had trouble with this. So we're, we're okay. hoping for better results today. So. Um, we'll see how it goes here. All right, so this is going to be your ta your prompt, I should say, to evaluate whether new imperialism of the late 1800s and early 1900s was caused primarily by political motivations or economic motivations. So when you're getting a task word like evaluate, that means they want you to look at the evidence and take a position, take a position. And we're using this word, what is your primary? So they're using this word primarily. So what will be your primary position? And the two variables they get, give you are, is this motivated by or caused by political motivations or by economic motivations? And so there will be seven documents, obviously, and that one of those documents will be an image. And so you need to quickly read through the documents and as you're reading through the documents, let's just take a quick look here. So as we're reading through our documents and there's our prompt again, one of the suggestions I have for you is to make a T-chart, okay? So we'll do that over here because we're doing either political motivations or economic motivations. And so make a T-chart over on the side of the documents and one side will be political and one side will be economic. And then you are going to read through your documents. And we always read the first source line first. So this is Prince Leopold, heir to the Belgian throne, a letter to one of his advisors. And so as we're reading this, or as you're reading it, you're thinking, is this um, a political motivation or an economic motivation? And you want to do that through each of them. And then as you decide, and I'm just going to put this down as an example, you're going to say, oh, maybe Doc 2, I think, is a political motivation. I put it on that side of the T-chart. And again, as an example, oh, I see, I think Doc 4, for example, is an economic motivation. And you kind of populate your T-chart. Your it helps you organize and carefully read the documents. But then it helps you think, okay, which of these arguments am I going to make? Because now I've got a T-chart and I've got it figured out which of the documents I can put down to support the, the claim I'm going to make. As we do our structure... So what will that essay look like? And we wanna begin broadly and then funnel down to the argument. And so this will be our contextualization paragraph. And one of the things that I suggested to you or Katie and I have talked to you about is if you're not sure how to get into this prompt, you know, you want to talk about new imperialism, the late 1800s and early 1900s. So what brings us into that? Um, the acronym we were, we've done on a couple videos is GeoSprite. Because if, I, if I'm not exactly sure where I want to start, I can begin with the geography, right? So I can begin by talking about a country that was part of new imperialism, or I could begin with a country where new imperialism occurred, or a continent, either one. And then 
I can be, start building sentences and I don't have to use all of these pieces, but I have sentence, his, you can use these to help create sentences. So geography sentence, where and when, place geography. I could use the S for what, what's the social situation if I wanted to use that. What's the political situation right now? What's, the, what's going on with religion? Does that fix into this? How about um, intellectual? Is there any new learning? What about technology? And what about economy? So we just use that to remind us of different ways that we construct sentences to help build the contextualization. Then we want to end this first paragraph with our thesis, also called a claim, also called an argument. You can use any of those words, but it needs to be in this first paragraph. So we have several sentences of contextualization that lead us into this thesis or claim. And when we make the thesis or claim, you wanna use the stem of the prompt to help you construct your response to the prompt. And so the claim could be something such as, we're gonna use this, the new imperialism of the late 1800s and early 1900s was caused primarily by, and this is where you make your, your choice, your argument. Are you gonna say political motivations or economic motivations? And then you're gonna use a comma and you're gonna say because, and you're gonna give two reasons. Reason number one, and reason number two. Because that will help you set up your next two body paragraphs, right? And it will help you determine, okay, after I've read the documents, I have a pretty good idea. One of the reasons is this, and one of the reasons is this. And then you're gonna be able to use the documents to support that reasoning. So we've made a, we've taken a position, right? With our choice and our argument and we've established our line of reasoning, okay? The other thing you could do here is, as we're thinking about complexity, is to make an acknowledgement that these are the primary reasons in the position you're taking, but you could also set up a complexity paragraph. That is a W. However, there were We'll call this the alt argument reasons as well. So this could also be in there. So let's just say if you're choosing uh, as a guess, politics here, you could put e economic motivations here. However, there were economic reasons as well. Does that make sense? And so that's how you construct that. And this is really important because now it's kind of set up the structure for the rest of your essay, right? So we've got our body paragraphs. This is gonna be reason number one that you've identified in this thesis. This is gonna be reason number two that you've identified in your thesis. And then with these reasons, you're gonna to want to use obviously the documents to support your reasoning. And because as Katie put it out on the rubric, we need to use six documents to get to all of the document usage and get that point. So use you know, two to three documents here, two to three documents here as evidence to support the reason that you're identifying. When you're doing this, we had one video where we spent a lot of time talking about sourcing. And so we said, you need to make the source happy, right? 
H is historical situation. A is audience. P is purpose. And the other P is point of view. And the Y is why is this significant or important? If significant. Okay. You do not have to use all four to get the sourcing point. So if you're doing two or three documents here, maybe one of those documents, you're going to do the sourcing analysis. You're going to make that source happy. And maybe one of them you're doing historical situation. Maybe one of them you're doing for audience. Maybe in this paragraph, you're doing another one that's audience. And maybe in this paragraph, you're doing one that's point of view. There isn't any, it's whatever is best comes to you and what you best think fits the sourcing of that particular document that they're giving you, okay? So make the source happy. And we want to do that times three. And Todd, if you don't mind me just reminding, because I've had students that get confused about this, the why does not stand alone. The why belongs with all of the other letters. So if you do the, the historical situation, you include the why. If you do the audience, yes. you include the why. So just to just a yep. of that. Absolutely. And you can think about the T structure, topic sentence, evidence, telling here's what the evidence is, and then the analysis. This historical situation is significant because, right, that gets you into it. Uh, and so I appreciate you pointing that out, Katie. All right. We got to continue. And then when you're getting to this point, because a lot of you are asking, you know, how do I make sure I'm watching my time and all that? When we get to this point, you have to make a decision. You can end your essay by restating the thesis. And you wanna, do you wanna talk to that, Katie? Yeah, sure. That um, Todd and I absolutely see students when we're at the AP reading who we know you haven't seen the documents before, you don't know the prompt and you begin writing your essay. And so by the time you get to the end, you're actually doing a much better job articulating that thesis in the conclusion so never copy it verbatim from the intro. I know some of you have probably been guilty of that in your essays at school. Try to do it a little bit better because if you fell short in the introduction, we will give you credit for the thesis and the conclusion. So when you're restating it, you definitely wanna to try to do it a little bit better, make sure it has a line of reasoning in it. And then as you are, um, if you are going past that, really try to do some context going forward. And you can see that's what Todd's, um, doing right there, try to connect it. Yeah, and there, you know, part of that is okay. Maybe my context wasn't good enough in the opening paragraph, and so I have another chance to earn that point here. But also, this is what good writers do. Good writers don't just end abruptly end their essay. And so, yes, we're conscious of time, but we're also developing skills that you're going to have for a lifetime. So, what about some context going forward? Connect to the next historical development. Okay, so this is about imperialism, and Katie just talked to you about how imperialism was a cause of World War I. There's a chance for you to bring that in there and connect that way. I said at this point you had a decision to make, and if you still have time, then you can earn this complexity and write your complexity paragraph. Okay, and we'll call that the alt argument. So this is our one path to complexity. It's not the only way, but I, I think students like having a plan. And this plan seems to, for a lot of students, it seems to, to sit really well. It's something they can see. So with our alt argument, that's when we're making this acknowledgement of this reason up here, right? And we're gonna use one or two documents again to support that argument. And again, if you haven't already used three of the sourcing, you can do that here as well if you need to satisfy that. Now there's only one more point available to us that we have not yet looked at. And that needs to that can occur kind of anywhere within the body of the paragraph. And that is where will our outside evidence go? Okay. So either here 
I'll just put outside evidence. Evidence beyond the documents. Where will you insert that? So it can be here or here or down here, but you need to be significant to earn that point for outside evidence. So there's a structure for you that gets you at all the different parts of the essay. And you have that T chart as well to help you organize it. And so I hope you find this structure helpful. And the best way to know whether it's gonna be helpful or not is to practice. practice. Yep, absolutely. Give it a practice. We'll go back to the PowerPoint. We'll get you going here. So there's your homework. The document-based question is the topic is imperialism um, and it can be accessed at that bit.ly. And then I did double check to make sure that our QR codes are correct today and they will get you into the document just fine. And we are eager to read your responses and turn those around and we will break them down point by point and give you feedback tomorrow. Do you want to do this, Katie? Um, yes, I will. I was waiting for you to pop up. <laughs> Catching up? Yes. Uh, yeah, it. So tomorrow, it's our last day. Um, again, today is a really good day. If you have questions, we're going to have some time for that. I think we are trying really hard to incorporate some of your questions into our narrative. But if you have specific questions, we're going to try to make sure that we address those tomorrow. Uh, we're going to do a quick content piece on the Cold War and contemporary Europe and economic integration, the EU. And then we're gonna talk through the different formats of the exam to make sure you know exactly what to expect, whether you're taking the exam next week, pencil and paper, or you're taking one of the digital administrations and then there'll be uh, you know, resources. And then Todd, you wanna do our shout outs for today? Yes, okay. So shout out to these schools because they were giving us responses and I uh, really appreciate that you're doing that. Brookfield Central High School in Brookfield, Wisconsin. They are the Lancers. Some nice responses there. Salem High School in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and they are the Sun Devils, go Sun Devils. And then Gregory High School in Modesto, California, they are the Jaguars. So shout out to you, to the schools. We appreciate you watching and we hope that you're finding these videos really helpful. So finally, we just wanna to say to you, thank you. And please like and subscribe to uh, Katie and myself on our YouTube channel. And I'm at Eastview High School in Apple Valley. Katie is at Coral Gable Senior High School in Miami. And oh my gosh, Katie, do you, have you ever wondered why you never see elephants hiding in trees? No, why do we never see elephants hiding in trees? Well, Katie, because they're so good at it. Of course, that's why, because they're so good at it. Oh. That's why you don't see them. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> All right. Thanks thank a lot, you guys. <laughs> Take care. One more day of dad jokes. <laughs> Bring them on.